All right. Well, um, I need to get started without our uh, fourth panelist, Omid, but I think we're going to have to, to do that. Um, and hopefully he'll, he'll work out the glitches and join us in a few minutes. If not, maybe we can bring him into the conversation through the chat. Um, so I, I'd just like to say hello and welcome everyone to our panel, Building Trust in the Impact Label. I'm so excited uh, to be joined today uh, by, well, three of four incredible <laughs> individuals um, so far, hopefully a fourth coming soon, um, real experts in the field of impact investing and stakeholder capitalism. I'll be very brief in the introductions to make sure we leave as much time as possible for the conversation. But uh, first, Elizabeth Boggs Davidson, who is director of SDG Impact, an exciting new initiative she's going to tell us about of the United Nations Development Program, uh, focused on mobilizing private sector capital to help achieve the SDGs. Bart Houlihan, co-founder of B Lab, which needs really no introduction, but most know is dedicated to using the power of business to solve social and environmental problems. Andrew Lee, head of sustainable and impact investing at UBS, where he supports clients who seek to incorporate impact and sustainability into their investments uh, and manages a 20 odd trillion dollar portfolio. <laughs> um, I'll also introduce Omid Saith, uh, head of the impact investing uh, initiative at Prudential Financial sees a nearly $1 billion portfolio um, and, and is in charge of all underwriting and portfolio management. So each of you comes at this topic from a quite a unique perspective of how to build trust in the impact label. I think we can all agree that the B Corp movement helped really redefine the purpose of business as we think about it today. Um, and now the impact investing industry is working to more clearly define impact uh, in, in the investment process with, with new standards, new policies, and new tools. Um, the, the firm I lead, Blue Mark, is, is also engaged in this work of building trust in the impact uh, label. A few weeks ago, uh, my colleagues and I at Tideline formally launched Blue Mark to provide impact verification services in response to a market. Looks like we lost Christina. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Come back. Let's give, let's give her a minute and uh, <clears throat> to see if she comes right back. And if not, we will add Libet uh, to- <laughs> We will carry on. <laughs> we will, we will carry on indeed. Let's give her a minute just to see if she comes back. She is our moderator for the session. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> Nothing like technology. Maybe give them one more minute. Uh, I'll wait. Oh, yeah. oh thank you. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. My gosh, this is um, a first. <laughs> no problem. Uh, well, I, I'm not quite sure where I was lost. Um, I was just giving a brief plug for Blue Mark, the new firm launched by Tideline uh, to provide independent impact verification services. Obviously, um, very uh, core to this um, mission of establishing trust in the impact label. Um, I, I would just like to say as well that for people who want to learn more about verification, Bluemark, um, our website, bluemarktideline.com is, is, is open, but also we'll be having a booth. Uh, so we'll, we'll man our booth at SOCAP virtually after this panel. So please join us for, to continue the discussion. 
Um, but the industry still has a very long way to go uh, to tackle the threat of impact washing and the risk of impact drift. Um, and that's what we're going to be discussing today on this panel. So um, with no further ado, I'd like to kick off uh, really with, with Elizabeth. And um, Elizabeth, you've been doing some really exciting work at SDG, at UNDP, launching SDG Impact. Um, would love if you could um, share with, with all of us why the market needs SDG Impact standards to help align business and investment decisions uh, with, with the sustainable development goals. Yeah. I'm happy to. Thank you, Christina. It's nice to be here. So SDG Impact is a global UNDP initiative, and it's really aimed at catalyzing investment to achieve the SDGs. Transparency and accountability in SDG investing was our real goal when we launched this initiative on the margins of the UN General Assembly in late 2018. How do you drive more accountability for claims that your investments are SDG enabling? So we've been developing SDG impact standards for bond issuers, for fund managers and enterprises, all to drive more positive investment and activity to where it's needed to support delivery of the SDGs by 2030. So UNDP is the development network of the UN system. It operates in 170 countries and it works across all sectors, all sustainable development goals. It's also the integrator of the sustainable development goals for the UN system, which means that it has a really unique responsibility and role in defining what SUD enabling investment is and needs to achieve. So UNDP entered this space because there were no guidelines and really no way to measure and create integrity around claims that investments were advancing the sustainable development goals. And without clear standards for what SUD enabling investment looks like, it's quite difficult to authenticate claims. So we know that much of the activity labeled SDG enabling has not yet translated to greater investment activity or capital being directed effectively to, to the achievement of the goals. And it's been super hard to differentiate who's using the SDGs as a reporting lens or really a tagging exercise and who's really using the goals to catalyze investment and contribute to their achievement. So over the last 18 months, um, we've been in the process working to develop standards that's really brought together the most developed practice and impact management into what we think is very actionable guidance for private investment funds, for bond issuers, and for companies that want to contribute positively to the goals. Business and investors are genuinely looking for this guidance. We did a lot of survey work with Tideline back in 2018 to, to establish that businesses are needing guidance to help translate their intent to action. So the standards have been designed really with that need in mind. The standards are um, really a set of practices around strategy, around management, transparency, and governance. They provide a common language and a best, really best practice guidance for integrating impact management into business and investment practices and decision making. Um, so, these are practice standards. They are not performance standards. They focus on the internal management and the decision-making practices very much in line with achieving the SDGs. So for us, they are a benchmark for best practice. And we're, we're finding that you know, SDG bond issuers or PE fund managers and companies can use the standards to really map their internal impact management systems, identify where there are really gaps in their systems, check and sort of rectify marketing of SDG claims, design and model future initiatives, and determine readiness for certification. Investors are using the standards to really frame investment guidelines and diligence questions, and to seek greater standardization of practice and assurance of products that are making these SDG claims. So the standards are an open source, they're public good, they're competitively neutral. It's the platform that practitioners and analysts and assurers can, can apply. Um, what we're doing now, the standards will be supplemented with a voluntary assurance framework that will include an SDG impact seal, um, which we want to, to make available to recognize best practice. And the accreditation process and the training curriculum 
um, Forest Shores is being developed in tandem with consultations on the standards. So the SDG Impact UNDP standards for private equity funds were launched officially on the 6th of October. They reflect two rounds of global public consultation with over 4,000 participants. Um, a working group of about 30 private equity funds was organized in September and started with working together with our team to, to implement, to apply the standards um, in their funds. And really the purpose of this is really to inform our guidance packages and to inform our assurance process. Uh, the first draft of the standards for enterprises has just been released on the 15th of October for a two month consultation period. And the um, SDG impact standards for bonds will undergo its final round of public consultation in November so that we expect to have final drafts of the, the bond and the enterprise standards available um, early in 2021. And we'll start piloting the assurance um, in early 2021. So I think that's enough for right now. Now I, can you hear Christina? No. Christina, Christina we can't can hear, hear you. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Um, I wanted to welcome you, first of all, to thank you, Elizabeth, for those comments. You've been extremely busy at UNDP. And to welcome Omid to the panel, uh, we, we maintain faith and, and introduced you as part of our uh, 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 of expert panelists. So thank you for being here, Omid. And, um, uh, we'll get back to some of the points you raised, Elizabeth, I hope, um, during the during the discussion, but I see people in the chat have shared links to the to the SDG impact standards. So Bart, I'd like to turn to you. Um, BLAB has pioneered uh, so many of the concepts behind stakeholder capital capitalism. And now really having achieved kind of some initial goals as part of what is a, a really dramatic movement to redefine the purpose of business. What What is driving what seems to be a dramatic acceleration in the movement and what challenges remain? Um, and, and, and then perhaps alongside that, you can talk a little bit more about the impetus behind the SDG Impact Act Action Manager that you've all launched with you and Global Compact and how that relates to the standards that Elizabeth just introduced. Sure. Sure. So first, thank you for having me, Christina. I appreciate the invitation and it's awesome to be here with some old friends. Um, so uh, excited to be with you all today. And first, kind of like at the highest level, I assume most people on at SOCAP would know what a B corporation is and what we do, but I'm not going to be totally presumptive. So let me just spend a second on like what we do and then I'll dive mm -hmm. into what's kind of driving some acceleration and address your other questions as well, Christina. And so I'm with B Lab. B Lab is the nonprofit behind the B Corporation movement. And at the highest level, what we're trying to do is build a movement of people using business as a force for good. And our approach is really simple. We find best in class companies that we certify as B Corporations. They've met the highest standards of social and environmental performance, and they've built it to last to a legal change. We have about 3,600 certified B Corporations in oh, 150 different industries, probably 80 countries, ranging from multi-billion dollar companies down to sole proprietors. And our hope is that if we shine a light on them and then provide tools for others to follow, that we'll build this movement, right? Where everybody is trying to use business as a force for good. And so that's kind of what we do. And Christina, what we're seeing is it's been a remarkable year. It's been a remarkable couple of years. And you asked what's driving, you know, the acceleration of kind of the broader movement of you know, impact and stakeholder capitalism. I think a few things are, are quite clear. Number one, I think traditional capitalism is under threat, uh, whether it be, you know, the recognition that uh, climate change is indeed an existential threat to uh, business entities and or uh, the additional threat of rising inequality. Like uh, inequality is not new, but it is accelerating. And all of that has led to some real pressure on the system. And we saw some of that um, in 2019 resulting in uh, the announcement from the business roundtable and uh, what came out of the WEF as their 
their new imperative, all of that was indicative of some cultural shifts. Now, fast forward to this year, Christina, and uh, the pandemic has sadly just laid bare the inequities of our current system. It's just abundantly clear that the economy just isn't working for everyone the same way. And as a result, what we've seen, both from companies and from governments, is uh, a huge increase in the interest in our work. Our, uh, in the first nine months of this year, we've had 37,000 companies register to use our, our tools. To give you perspective, it took us five years to get to 25,000. And in the first nine months, we've had 37,000 using the tools to be more like a B corporation. Uh, the other things that we're seeing in just the first nine months, we've had 1,800 companies apply to actually certify. Uh, they've, they've gone all the way through the process and said they want to be a leader and part of this community. And also really interesting, Christina, our attrition rates are at record lows. Despite the incredible impact on the global economy of the pandemic, our community is thriving. And so uh, the combination of climate change inequality and the pandemic has really encouraged people to not return to normal. You know, that I think people are asking, coming out of this pandemic, what is the new normal? And that question is happening at the very highest level of government. It's happening at the very highest level of the private sector. And civil, civil society is contributing where they can to make sure that we're part of that, that conversation. In terms of, you know, what the challenges are for us moving forward, I think there's a few. Uh, one, we need to scale with integrity, Christina. Like it, it's, it's really exciting that we have a profound interest, which we think is authentic from multinationals. And I think most, for those people familiar with our movement, it began as a small medium uh, enterprise movement and has only recently in the last five years migrated to larger multinationals. And we are beautifully inundated with requests to engage in the movement. Uh, and we need to do that carefully, right? At the end of the day, we've got to uphold the integrity and the rigor of the certification while simultaneously welcoming people into the movement, no matter where they are, and say, join us on this journey to use business as a force for good. And to that end, we uh, released a new product, oh, about two months ago, something called B Movement Builders. And it's specifically for multinationals who aren't yet ready for the certification, but want to use the tools and be supportive of the broader effort to use business as a force for good. And so that's one of our efforts to try to scale with integrity. The other big um, the challenge has always been, uh, Christina, uh, companies adopting our legal framework. As I said, there's two elements to certify. One is you take and pass our impact assessment and it's verified and the second is you change your legal governance to include the interests of stakeholders so that you are accountable to not just creating money for your investors, but also while you're operating your business, creating real value for society and the environment. That legal change is a big deal, right? It changes fiduciary duty. And it has been, we have passed legislation now in four countries and in 40 states creating a new corporate form that allows you to live into that aspiration to align your mission with your governance. That change is hard for uh, public companies. And the good news is we're seeing the dam start to break, whether it be uh, Amalgamated Bank, which is a certified B Corps, took the vote, their public company, they took the vote to change into this new legal form that's called the Benefit Corps earlier this year. And they had a 99% uh, approval of the change. Danone in Paris, the global uh, dairy business uh, and food business, uh, took their vote about two months ago. Uh, and I think it was 28 million to less than a million in terms of in support of this change. Um, Lemonade uh, went public. It's an insurance company. Went public earlier this year as a benefit core and a certified B core. It was the best IPO of the year. Uh, and then we just saw a company called, that we don't know, a company called Viva, which is a life science company, a $46 billion life science company, actually put out a proxy statement to a vote to change into a benefit corporation. And that vote is pending. And so 
there are, there are cracks in the dam about adopting this uh, legal framework at scale. It will be uh, a process. It won't be an event, uh, Christina, but I would say those are the big uh, challenges for the movement, scaling with integrity and figuring out how to get broader adoption of the legal. And then finally on the SDG Action Manager, listen, we're, we're also uh, totally clear that the idea of B corporations is still uh, really a, a, an idea that not many people know about globally. The SDGs have broken through. They've absolutely broken through. And it's so encouraging and exciting. And the idea of partnering with uh, the UNGC about trying to take our work with our impact assessment and relate it back to the SDGs, but just like Elizabeth said, give people a roadmap on how to use their business to try to achieve the, achieve the SDGs. We were hearing over and over people say, listen, I love the SDGs, I don't know what to do. Like, where do I start? How do I contribute to these goals? And so we spent oh, about 18 months with our partners at the UNGC building a tool that's free and totally available for anybody to use and lets you set targets that gives you a clear pathway to contribute to the SDGs that matter most for your business. And I'll stop there. Bart, I have to say during a time when we could all be so despondent about the state of state of the world, the state of politics, the economy, um, I think you could go into providing emotional psychological therapy. Um, <laughs> that's about the most optimistic um, kind of uh, treatise I've heard for a while. And the, the, the um, the tagline scale with integrity is one we've really adopted at Blue Mark as well. We think it's absolutely critical at this point in time, especially as the, 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 the B Corp movement, but also impact investing, sustainable investing, you know, sort of gains um, share of hearts and minds. We need to ensure um, that we scale this market with integrity um, and not the expense of integrity. Um, so I'm going to turn to Omid now. Um, Omid, you're running one of an extremely large institutional <laughs> portfolio of impact investments, and Prudential has a really uniquely influential role in this market. I think bringing such a range of of capital types. Um, I, you know, I'd like to talk about Prudential's early experience in using kind of uh, third party tools. Um, you know, as a way to help, you know, again, scale with integrity and um, make more efficient its evaluation of, of funds that it's investing in. Um, so one of those tools was the GEARS rating framework, which was an early, really an early framework in this market to, um, to bring impact investment ratings akin to credit ratings for impact funds. And B-Lab was, was very, obviously, spearhead. Why, why didn't Gears succeed um, you know, at that time? How, how does impact verification now fit into Prudential's approach to due diligence and, and managing impact funds? Um, yeah. Yeah. Just right there. yeah, no, thank you for the, for the kind introduction. And, and just as sort of context for people who are not familiar with our program, I think, you know, we are about a billion dollar fund uh, all invested in private assets, but invested both in real assets as well as in businesses and social purpose enterprises, as well as being invested both directly in transactions and through fund managers and doing debt and equity. And so from that vantage point, we've, we've seen a sort of a lot of perspectives. Uh, one of the things that we did try to do, I think, with our fund portfolio, particularly for our, our private equity fund managers, was to really insist that they adopt the GEAR standard. Um, and one of the things that we learned actually is that, you know, as even relatively modest capital allocators to an individual fund, you have tremendous power to dictate impact reporting and impact standards. I think uh, just a few investors asking for something, you may you know, prompt a little bit of grumbling from your managers, but at the end of the day, um, there is tremendous power at the investor level to demand reporting enhanced standards. So that's one successful. Um, we're now doing that around things like diversity and inclusion metrics as well. So one lesson we took away was actually, you know, small people demanding disclosure can happen. Um, so that's a positive. Uh, we did want people to adopt sort of the GEARS tool and ultimately the B Corp analytic framework because we wanted a standardized instrument to look at 
people who are investing in a range of geographies, a range of stages, a range of companies. Um, I think what was successful as an in, was sort of the ability of the tool to be an assessment of individual companies. If you listen to Bart, that's sort of where the movement is really built into thinking about sort of how do you evaluate a company comprehensively. I think the challenge as a user for sort of rolling up a portfolio is that, and this is sort of a challenge for all of us who are sort of looking at bigger data sets and bigger sort of universes, and Andrew can I think talk even more about this in even larger context, is sort of how do you balance a tool that has rigor in the specific with a tool that has sort of universal applicability. And so if you look at sort of all of the stuff that's going on sort of in the public markets and ESG, that's one of their core challenges is that they're trying to apply it to such a vastly different data set um, that you necessarily have to get to a certain level of shallowness to apply across the board. And this has been something that actually I think has been a real tension um, that we've eventually I think solved by recognizing that we didn't care as much to have broad based metrics that apply to everything in the portfolio. We actually thought we found that we're much more able to come up with compelling impact metrics by really circling subsets of the portfolio and identifying what were the two or three core elements that those investors were designed to change. So if it was around sort of job skilling and job training, looking at job and wage growth um, and looking at a few very narrow, very precise measures for a sub or subset of the portfolio, rather than looking for universal measures. Um, so that was one sort of big insight was that that was more valuable to us in terms of sort of telling the story of the portfolio. The second, and I think, you know, deeper sort of challenge for any large investor is that even if you get good data and you aggregate it up, you're left with a stat that's somewhat devoid of meaning. So for example, we could say that our portfolio created 38,642 good jobs. We're very proud of that measurement exercise, but that data point was like so many other data points kind of devoid of meaning because you couldn't contextualize relative to what? Was that a lot of jobs created, a lot of good jobs created, or was that exactly the number of jobs that any set of private equity funds would have created? And I do think one of the challenges for our, our measurement systems right now is, and especially I think when you're thinking about private equity, you're measuring outputs. And outputs are often gonna be a function of sort of the scale of the investment you invest in. So if you invest in a bigger thing, it'll have bigger output. If you invest in a rapidly growing thing, the delta will grow rapidly because you're investing in a rapidly growing. Um, in the capitalist system, you know, the, the ability of something to grow is a function ultimately of the business model. And so I think we're measuring growth and outputs as opposed to, I think, measures of quality. And I think that's sort of where we've really tried to hone in on to is to think about what are measures of quality, suitability, fit. Um, you know, I'll give you examples, especially in financial services, this becomes really paramount. You think about sort of a segment like serving subprime borrowers. Serving subprime borrowers in an ethical and transparent way can be incredibly good. Providing people access to products they're not ready for without the appropriate guardrails can be incredibly bad. Measures of outputs in that sense of serving sort of you know marginalized communities without measures of quality don't tell you. So I think one thing that we've really honed in on is, is trying to really look at measures of quality. Um, the bigger holy grail that we don't have though is measures of context. So to measure sort of is this portfolio exceeding a benchmark relative to others, right? So if you think about conventional financial measures, you measure alpha and performance over benchmarks, you don't measure absolute returns and say this is good or bad. And right now we don't have that capacity uh, in a meaningful way. And I think that's partly what sort of erodes trust. I mean, to go back to the sort of conference label, people are, are seeing lots of stats and lots of measures, but can't really tell if that's good or bad. And I think the dirty little secret, and you know, I think well, maybe it's not so dirty, but Part of what you're seeing, quite frankly, is if you took the entire universe of capitalism, of course you can find stuff that was good, right? We can circle historically stuff that was good and that was happening in the marketplaces. And anyone who's got a large enough portfolio can filter out the good stuff and say, look, I've got 5 billion of good stuff. I've got 10 billion of good stuff. I've got 100 billion of good stuff. Look, I'm good. And people see that and it takes a second to think, I guess that kind of makes sense, but it has to be contextualized against what is the amount of good stuff in the overall market and are we actually doing anything to add to impact, fix problems that aren't being fixed? It's that quality of sort of additionality and change that I think we're not getting. So I think we are aptly proving that there is good stuff, there's thoughtful stuff, there's stuff that can be measured in what is going on in capitalism. But I think the skepticism people feel is that if there's all this good stuff, why are there so many problems? And so I think we're starting from a vantage point of measuring the good stuff that was in the capitalist system, as opposed to a vantage point of saying, here are the problems 
the clear problems, and what are these investments doing to move the needle on solutions to those problems? Um, and so I think that's sort of a, a structural challenge. So that's, I've said a lot, but that's just some initial observations. There was a tremendous amount packed into what you just said, Omi, but what I love is that you somehow elegantly transitioned us from you know, the building blocks that Bart and team are putting together of building the B Corp movement at, at the at the corporate level, the adoption of rigorous standards of what constitutes real stakeholder accountability at the company level. Um, but 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 to the challenges for an investor from an investor standpoint of aggregating a portfolio and ensuring that when you're managing a billion dollars of assets, you're 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 actually holding at a portfolio level um, to 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 levels of of accountability for impact, you know, equivalent to those for financial performance. So much packed in there. I think we want to get back to the conversation about impact measurement and reporting um, challenges and issues, which is uh, kind of perennially uh, vexing uh, problem for us. But uh, before we do, Andrew, um, I, I want to turn to you because uh, Andrew is in the unique position. I feel like we're almost taking this layered approach here in this panel unique position of representing you know both a, a massive asset allocator and asset manager uh, of sustainable and impact products um, so you're kind of seeing two different um, seeing the market from these two different perspectives UBS also recently made the audacious announcement that it would seek to recommend sustainable investments wherever possible over traditional uh, options for all of its wealth management clients uh, which represents 2.6 trillion in assets, I I believe. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Andrew, I'd love to hear first of all what you know, kind of the thinking behind this, this this announcement. Um, but but more to the point, how are you as you seek to you know really help catalyze massive amounts of capital towards sustainable and impact investments, relying on um, you know accountability mechanisms, verification mechanisms. To ensure that you are you are allocating assets to the right to the right products or the best impact products. Yeah, um, it's a great question. So, uh, first of all, thanks, Christina, again for for having me on the panel. I think it's great to be here with all of you. Um, couldn't agree more with uh, many of the things that Bart, Elizabeth, and Omid have have already kind of um, indicated, and I think that. Um, you know, you asked about the announcement. I think that um, for us, the announcement's just the evolution um, of a shift that we've seen over the years um, of investors recognizing, you know, that sustainability matters, right? Whether it's Bart was saying climate, actually, you know, people finally realize that this is a problem, right? Um, or, you know, inequality, which, you know, has been something that's been on our radar for a while. Um, and yet all of a sudden now this year brings, um, you know, inequality issues into stark focus, right? So um, I think there's a realization increasingly amongst investors that, um, and private investors, right? Individual investors who've been used to looking at returns only perhaps and thinking about, um, you know, the doing good through philanthropy. But um, I think this realization is really kind of inflected over the last few years. And I think this year in particular. Um, and, and so, you know, for us, it wasn't about this year or uh, it was more of an evolution of, you know, from an investment perspective, we do believe and we have long believed that, um, you know, sustainability factors, whether it's ES or G, um, do impact investments. Um, and, and help investors from a risk and opportunity perspective in ways that can't be ignored. So from an investment perspective, um, I think all of that was in place. I think you've now seen um, demand from individual investors come into the market alongside, um, I think, what are scalable products that um, uh, belong on, on broader platforms um, come in to enable investors to really build full diversified portfolios that reflect sustainability. Um, in some way, shape, or form, um, into their uh, into their portfolios in ways that uh, allow them to uh, implement the objectives that they have that are beyond just financial return. And so, I think on the one hand, I think that's incredibly exciting, right? Because it means that the things that many of the people in this room um, have been working on for so long, um, you know, we are seeing a continued flow of capital and interest, and perhaps a, a, a real focus now. Um, on the fact that there are real problems, as Omid said, you know, that need to be solved. 
um, and bringing more capital to bear um, in investment portfolios is really something that's that's great. Um, and I think the increased sophistication of investors in understanding how that capital is invested and how sustainability is incorporated into portfolios, that's also really exciting. But I think, um, as Omid was starting to allude to, um, the risk is that people get <clears throat> um, misled by you know false statistics or things that are meant to provide transparency and are you know perhaps have good intentions, um, but in the end end up not leading people to the, towards the right conclusions, right? So um, you start to look at products um, in liquid portfolios, for example, where um, you know people feel better or investors feel better because they're aligned to a set of better companies or they're thematically focused, and you know there's reporting. Um, that indicates that, you know, my portfolio versus a benchmark portfolio, you know, you've removed X amount of, uh, of emissions from, um, from, 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 from something, right? But actually you haven't, right? Those emissions are still there. Um, and so, you know, so I think, um, you know, there's a little bit of the danger of metrics leading people down the wrong path. And so, you know, I think the focus on the impact end of the spectrum where people are really coming with an intent to drive intentional change, to drive measurable change, you know, that we're all looking for, um, you know, I think the increasing sophistication of a broad set of investors around the table, individual investors, um, really means that people are starting to realize that, you know, I can do certain things in philanthropy. I can do certain things by perhaps excluding, you know, excluding companies from my portfolio and signaling to um, companies what's important. I can use, you know, I, I, thematic um, opportunities are great in, in a diversified portfolio, but what are they actually accomplishing in terms of, you know, inflecting us or creating that delta um, that we know needs to be um, needs to be addressed um, in order to actually address the SDGs, right? To go back to what Elizabeth was saying, um, are we actually addressing the core problems that we all face? Um, and so that kind of points people towards where is that product set that actually does um, generate uh, generate real impact, um, right? And and create the delta, um, and that I think is what people are focused on now increasingly. So I think with the broad flow of capital in. Um, there are some things that, um, you know, as Omid was alluding to, you accept um, certain things, right, in order to broadly move capital um, into the space, particularly in liquid markets, where the scale is important to signal to companies that change is required. But I think, um, you know, at this impact end of the spectrum, where we say there's an intention to drive change, what is it? Like, how can we actually be certain that someone who's labeling their fund an impact fund? Um, to go back to the, the origins, right? The gears, uh, the, the, you know, starting from, from the roots of gears and what, what, what B-Lab built. Um, but what's actually driving change? If I, as an investor, am allocating capital and someone's telling me, whether it's the fund manager or an intermediary or, or what have you, that change is happening, what is that change that's actually happening? And can you quantify it for me in a way that's more than just, you know, this delta in the public markets that's not actually indicating um, that anything tangible is changing? So I think it comes down to, um, you know, impact standards or impact frameworks principles, right? So the IFC's impact operating principles. Um, how do we actually, um, you know, how can we be sure that uh, things are actually happening when we say, when someone says um, impact is actually being created, how are we measuring that? How's it actually being managed along the way? Um, and to Amid's last point, maybe I'll stop here around additionality. How do we know that it wouldn't have happened otherwise, right? Um, and I think that um, that's something that really needs to be proved out is what's, what's happening? Is it capital that wasn't being um, brought to the table before? Um, or is it, you know, that particular investor um, is able to open up networks and really drive impact and help companies to achieve the impact that they're looking for, whether it's through scale or additional expertise or relationships um, that um, that really points us in the direction, the right direction and starts to get back to um, the idea of the SDGs, right? What are the SDGs? They show us the gaps. And if we're going to close the gaps, we actually have to show the delta, not just incremental change in our portfolios. And the context is really important, as, uh, as Omid alluded to. Thank you, Andrew. I'm, this conversation has gotten so sophisticated. I want to step back for just one moment and lest our participants think we're still struggling with everything. <laughs> I think a lot of what Andrew was saying, if I can try and paraphrase, 
is, is that we've made really incredible leaps and bounds as an industry when it comes to almost like ex ante accountability mechanisms for how we sort, how we classify products and how we hold um, uh, investors and investment managers accountable to their practices. Uh, when it comes to ex sort of ex post frameworks for measurement, uh, measuring what actually happened, did, did the intended impact occur? Um, I think that's where both Omid and Andrew, you're touching on still some really significant vaccine challenges. And I, I want to I just dive a little deeper into that, that question, because I think we're, we're, we're at a point in the market where there's, there's almost two camps. You know, I think, I think we heard from both Andrew and Omid right now that you know, the danger of anchoring to, to a narrow set of metrics or attempting to sort of uh, anchor to a universal metric of impact at the portfolio level or what have you, um, the importance of qualitative information and mechanisms. And yet there's, there's a, a real camp that says the holy grail here is that we hold this market to the same level of rigor and of, account of accounting rigor as our, our financial standards. Um, so I'd, I'd like to just dig in a little bit there and, and ask you, you know, about this, this question, maybe I'll, I'll turn it back to Omid, you know, is, is sort of a highly standardized and quantitized, quantitative basis for impact outcomes, you know, just, uh, is it the holy grail or is it something we shouldn't actually, is it a false, uh, false a mission we shouldn't be pursuing? Hmm. It's a great question. I, I think oh, standardized. Me. Oh, am I? You heard? Yeah, are we? Okay. Um, yep. Sorry. So I, I, it's a great question. I think that you know certainly the work that SASB and others have done to define what a unit is or define what an it is in a common language, I think, is really, really valuable. And the analogy to sort of accounting is is very apt. And adding rigor and standardization there so that when people are describing something and we're all talking about the same thing is quite, quite valuable. I still think at the end of the day, you know, values are human and values are not universal. We can disagree and share and be combative about values. So I think this will necessarily be more difficult than simply measuring financial performance, right? Because there is a diversity of values. Um, and I would even go further and say, to think that we've got a universality even on the financial questions today, right? We don't have to look at the capital markets to see that, you know, things don't trade on PE multiples anymore. And every company worth its salt is reporting non-GAAP financials alongside GAAP financials and a whole slew of measures. And so the, the standardization function is useful. It's useful to have GAAP even when everyone reports non-GAAP. But the, the point that needs to be taken is that, of course, people are gonna report non-GAAP measures or non-SASB measures. And, you know, that'll be even more diversified when it comes to, to necessarily, you know, complex value questions. Um, and so I think leaning away from that as opposed to into that, I think is one of the mistakes. I, I don't think, again, and I don't think because values are not universal, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be able to sort of transparently disclose what they are and measure what the, those different values are and then investors having some ability to choose. Um, I think one other point I'd make, and I think it's really worth thinking about, is that so much of our logic in the financial markets is commingling and diversification, right? So you think about a private equity fund, you think about an index fund, the whole rubric underlying it is you buy everything and you put it together and you get better outcomes. None of us think about our social impact that way. I wouldn't want a commingled diversified charity. Like for the love of God, that would seem crazy, right? People, some people care about whales, other people care about you know, children and others. That's part of our problem is that so much of the internal plumbing and architecture of the financial system is designed to blend different things together. And in so doing, we actually, I think, have to think about what are ways in which we can give people more idiosyncratic ability to access impact um, and make that transparent and allow people to have a greater diversity of choices. I think that's great there. Great. Thanks, Omid. Um, I'd like to um, um, actually turn to you, Bart, as well on this question, just to get, you know, the lens from sort of the B, the B Corp um, perspective. I mean, B, the B Corps obviously are held to, uh, you know, kind of a rigorous legal standard. They're held to a rigorous standard of corporate practices. 
and operational um, measures. What about the impacts that B Corps are having in the world and, and, and how is B Lab thinking about sort of those ex post frameworks for measuring actual contributions to, for example, the SDGs and, and, and holding corporations to account to, to their stated yeah. alignment? It, it, uh, I agree with all that was said that it is, it's super challenging to take the outputs that we see being delivered by our community of certified B corporations, translate them into outcomes and impact. Like that has been the, for this entire space, for as long as I've been in it, which is now 15 years, that has been incredibly challenging is how do you, can you, and is it fair to take an output uh, and then determine an outcome and an impact thereafter? That remains uh, challenging even for us. And the way that we've tried to look at it, Christina, is our e easiest way to uh, evaluate this is if all companies acted like AB Corporation, how would the world be different? That, that has been the framework through which we've tried to define our impact. We know that these B Corps are doing these things on equity, diversity, inclusion, on offsetting uh, carbon, on uh, creating high quality living wage jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so our, our easiest framework to, dis to describe the impact that we have is if we could convince all companies to be more like a B Corps, this is what the world would look like. Admittedly, that's a narrative that works for us and doesn't work for everybody. And I do want to, I want to back up also a little to your, to your question about the Holy Grail, because I do want to, I do want to agree wholeheartedly with Omid that it is necessary, but insufficient. At the end of the day, the harmonization that we're all seeking, and the good news, Christina, is I tell you, like, there is more action on the harmonization than we've had in a decade. People are playing nice. They're having real honest conversations. Our friends at IMP, uh, led by Clara, Barbie, has really been quite catalytic in bringing us together to talk about how to try to harmonize. And without that harmonization, you're not going to get scale and you're not going to get comparability. But it isn't, it isn't the holy grail. It's necessary, but insufficient. Great, great. I love that answer. Um, I do want to make sure we get we give some chance for the um, audience Q and A. I'm going to. Um, um, well, there's there's quite a few questions that are around B Corps and B Labs. I'm going to take a chance and have one of the uh, participants who are waiting in the queue to ask a live question. And see if we can make this work. Get it, get a little bit more interactive here instead of me just um, mediating this conversation. That being said, I'm going to ask whoever's brought in to please keep the question brief and to the point, so we leave time for for the rest of the discussion. So I'm going to start here with uh, Mary Wong. Let's see if this works. Oh. I'm trying to let her in. Let's see. Okay, I apologize. I'm, I'm, think, um, I'm afraid that's not working. Okay, so I'm going to, um, to continue then and, um, you know, I think one of the questions here is around, you know, as as impact and sustainability reporting is becoming increasingly common, increasingly um, pervasive as a recognized requirement, what what role do the regulators play? Um, and what's the most, uh, I'll just add to that, what's the most productive role for regulators and other state institutions to play in both, in both, um, enforcing standards that are being created um, and um, and making really prescriptive requirements about about disclosures. Um, Elizabeth, why don't I start with you? Um, okay, so we absolutely think that regulation is important and but probably more so the the huge interest and surge I would suggest in creating taxonomies and metrics and trying to have much more um, much more information about how to measure and manage 
is has been helpful. But what's really been missing is, is that these taxonomies and these metrics need to operate within a context. And what we found that when we were looking at this really crowded landscape, as as we've heard about, that and how to be additive in that landscape, that with all the principles which are you know really setting high level purpose and with all of the new performance standards and metrics and taxonomies, this increasingly confident landscape, nobody is really paying attention to practice and how things are done, not just what things get done. So our sort of point of departure when we started thinking about these practice standards were, you know, how do you really change behavior? And unless and until you change behavior, you're not gonna see real change. It continues to be a tagging exercise or an output exercise. So what we've been focused on is regulation is necessary perhaps, but what's even more necessary is giving investors and companies that management system to be able to operationalize their intentions at the high level and then in a consistent way support the reporting at the tools level and that this would really drive standardization, it would drive transparency and assurance, which are also necessary to growing this market more at scale. And we think that you know if you open this up and you make it very transparent, that you reduce that potential for the market fragmentation through a lot of bespoke implementations of impact practice that sort of impede that comparability and that transparency. So what we've been trying to do is to map alignment between the existing principles and these new regulations and sort of if you really think um, in a very concerted fashion going through these standards about you know your strategic intent and how you do that your impact measurement and management and embed that in a way that that is consistent and comparable and report out in a transparent way that the regulation will this you know the performance will drive the regulation not vice versa Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, Andrew, I think you spend probably a lot of your days um, thinking about the regulators and what's coming next down the pike. Um, I, I, I think, Elizabeth, you did a nice job of, of just um, laying out the importance of practices um, as well as results uh, kind of measurement frameworks, um, the, the means being as important as the, as the end, so to speak. But you know, as these standards kind of evolve and, and get refined, is this, a, you know, will, will the standards lead to more regulation or will they be helpful in terms of optimizing the role of regulators in this market, Andrew? What's your, your perspective coming at it from a large financial institution? That's a really good question. I mean, I want to say that I think they will do the latter. Um, I think that they will help regulators with, um, with with where they're trying to go with things. I think just being a little bit careful about um, saying what regulators should or should not do. Um, I, I think that a lot of what we've seen um, has been focused on maybe on the sustainability side of things and standards around that and common frameworks. And I think that what still needs to happen is more uh, standardization. And I don't think this piece of it comes out of the regulators necessarily on the impact piece of it um, and understanding what the outcomes are and so forth. And I don't know that um, we've, we've quite gotten to a place where that piece of it is standardized. Um, and I think that there's that, um, you know, so there's an element of understanding what's happening in your portfolio on a common kind of framework basis. Um, and I think there is a lot of great work that's being done at the regulator level. Um, and, and then by a number of the, uh, you know, the industry bodies out there, right? Um, but I think that the impact piece um, is an interesting one that's still kind of out there um, to say, okay, can we understand, you know, what outcomes are actually being generated and acknowledging all of what Bart said about the difficulty of doing that and about, you know, people saying that, you know, we want to be able to optimize for these three legs of risk, return, and impact. I don't think we're there yet um, in a way that, um, you know, you could legitimately say that. I think we're in a way that there in a way that you can say you can optimize for risk and return and understand better what the impacts are of various, um, you know, elements in your portfolio. Uh, but I don't think we're there to kind of optimize for it. So I wouldn't want anybody to think that that's the case. But, but I also don't think that that's driven by regulators, right? I think the regulators can be very helpful in terms of, um, you know, setting certain standards um, and, um, uh, and, and that can be helpful. Um, but I do think that investors have to kind of take what they're given then and 
as, as I think Elizabeth was going on, um, you know, implement their own management systems um, for impact um, that take that into account. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think we're headed in the, the right direction, but I think if you're focused on impact, um, there's still a bit more work to be done there. Great. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I, I um, you know, it, it relates to an, another, I think, big question that still hangs over our market as the standards keep evolving. Bart, you mentioned, you know, the great work that IMP and others are doing to help harmonize standards, particularly for corporate reporting, right? An integrated approach to corporate reporting. On the investor side, you know, we still have a lot of competing standards. People still complain about the alphabet soup, even though we, you know, we think we're advancing, it's getting clearer. Uh, how do we push for sort of the optimal, what is the optimal array of harmonized um, impact investment standards for the market? What does that look like uh, in your mind? Maybe I'll start with Omid as a, as a uh, representing an asset owner, institutional asset owner point of view, and then turn to you, Elizabeth. Yeah, I, so I would echo that the IMP's work has been really, I think, very powerful and one of the best examples we've seen of harmonization. For people who are not familiar with it, I think the key thing that I can take away from that, and see some of the questions in the chat are about this, is that it's a measurement of investor practices. You know, the questions you asked, the things you looked at, the, you know, the, the mechanisms on exit, it's, it, it measures sort of what we would think of as the in, investor value add. Um, as opposed to the underlying companies. And I think people have asked some questions about culture. I think part of its success is really looking at that question. Um, and that's why I think it, and, and I, I'm of two minds. You know, sometimes I think, you know, it's the most important thing actually in the world is really to identify and measure investor culture and the norms that are being used to guide decision making. On the other hand, it can also be the weakest because it has no specific outputs tied to it. But I do think it really matters over time that we're getting there and we're harmonizing what it means to be an impact investor. Um, similarly, though, I don't think, for all the reasons we talked about earlier, that we'll ever in the alphabet soup on the on the underlying impacts, and I think that's okay. Um, um, I actually think it may be a, a virtue, not a flaw. Um, and I do think one of the things that's starting to happen to your earlier question, I think, is really interesting, is what the dynamic is between investor practices and regulatory practices. So as regulators demand greater disclosure and greater standardization, that's one pressure avenue. Investors have been asking for that, or at least impact investors have been asking for some of that. And the hope, and again, it's, it's too early to say whether it plays out, is that there's a positive ratchet effect. That people in the regulatory community can point to successful investor standards and investors can use sort of the regulatory levers to get more wholesome disclosure on questions. So I think that's the positive case. I think the other thing that's starting to happen that I think is really interesting is you're starting to see greater, and Bart, I'd love to be, I mean, you, you guys have obviously taken the B-Lab movement globally, but one of the things I think we're starting to see here certainly in the U.S. is fragmentation between markets taking, even within the U.S., taking very different views on the regulatory state. If you look at California, whether it's the CAFE standards or the new cases of Uber and labor. Um, so I think it's really interesting to think about sort of how much potential fragmentation await us in terms of where the regulatory state goes. I can't hear you. I hear you, Christina. <laughs> can't hear you. I'm speeding along now because we're we're up against time. I apologize. Um, so in 20 seconds or less, I'm going to ask each of you, and, and please do go off mute as I forgot to do, um, to, you know, as we're, we're reaching this inflection point towards stakeholder capitalism and gaining ever greater momentum um, on sustainable and impact investing, what is your, what is your big prediction for 2021? What, either what's the big, biggest challenge we still face that we need to tackle or, or wh wh what you expect? Um, to, to be coming down the pike in the year to come. So Bart, I'll start with you and, and then um, go ahead. Sure, 20 seconds or less. I, I hope 2021, and I think we have signs of it, it's gonna be the year of collaboration. The year where we've had this amazingly 
beautiful but pretty bespoke and diverse field starting to come together around shared initiatives. I think the Imperative 21 effort that launched about a month ago was a good indicator of the power of bringing these different disparate organizations together around a common idea of resetting our capitalistic system. I, I'm hoping that we'll see more of that in 2021. Without it, we got a long, long road. Great. Thanks, Bart. Elizabeth? Uh, yeah, I can pick up right where Bart left off. <clears throat> For me, I guess stakeholder capitalism, I hope that this means putting sustainability and impact on people on the planet at the heart of what we do. And I think that investors in 2021 will be more focused on taking a more holistic view beyond those short-term financial values and really appreciating more of the interconnectedness of the goals. Um, so I, I do think we're going to see an improvement and, and more of a focus on impact. Great. Andrew. So agree with Bart and Elizabeth. I think collaboration um, uh, is going to be huge and I do think we're going to see a focus on what's important. I think we will see a continued flow of capital at scale into broadly sustainable and impact investing and what's that, what that is going to create together with that emphasis on impact that Elizabeth mentioned is a need for investors to really pick through and understand what are the right solution sets that help them meet their objectives from an impact perspective. So um, continued flow but need for more rigor. I'm loving the optimistic trend in these comments. No pressure, Omid, but it's all on you to wrap it up. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, I'm, I'm not the optimist in the group. So I, I think we we continue to see the incredible, I and mean, whether you call it the K-shape recovery or what's happened with sort of the, the, the pull forward of technology. And I think this is probably the first year, and you see it in the suit that just got filed with Google, where I think we start to have some really serious questions about sort of monopoly power um, and particularly sort of the role in technology in society and what that's doing from an inequality perspective. Um, just given sort of what's happened with the devastating impact on small businesses versus the incredible success for large businesses um, and what that feel looks like when we, we do come out of COVID. Great. Well, greater scale, greater accountability and greater clarity of purpose is I think the themes that came out of this. I, I know we, we didn't have time to get into so many of the issues that were, were touched on, but thank you so much. You've been a fabulous panel. Apologies to everybody about the technical glitches, not least on my own part, but um, so much. Appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Christina. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. <laughs>